modern Japan is one of the most mono-ethnic countries in the world, and it's easy to believe that it's always been this way. However, the land of the rising sun has always been home to many unique peoples. Among them are the Ainu, the long-bearded, free-spirited, bear-hunting animists on the Isle of Hokkaido. In this video, we will put a spotlight on these forgotten aborigines of Japan, providing an introduction to their mysterious culture and telling the story of their ultimately doomed struggle against Japanese expansion. The Ainu subsisted of bear liver and dried fish, but if that's not your thing, the sponsor of this video, Boksu, is here to give you the best snacks from across Japan. It's truly a unique product. Boksu is a monthly snack box subscription that partners with century-old family snack makers to deliver exclusive Japanese snacks and tea pairings to your door. Every month, you'll receive a box with a different theme and different snacks. It's a gourmet journey through Japan every month. This month's Boksu is all about summer fruits, and if there's one piece of advice of ours you take to heart, let it be this. Orange stick cake is absolutely fantastic, you've got to try it. Boksu has sent us one of these boxes, and once we started tasting it with our friends and loved ones, it was impossible to stop. You can order an individual box, a single month or multi-month subscriptions, starting at $36.99 per box. You can auto-renew, with the option to pause or cancel any time. Your first box will ship out within one to two weeks straight from Japan. Ordering Boksu is one of the best ways to bring Japan into your home. So get 10% off your own authentic Japanese snack box from Boksu and save up to $47 using our code and link in the description. Don't forget that this also supports our channel. The Ainu are an ancient people whose ancestors have inhabited Hokkaido, the Kuril Islands and Kamchatka for millennia. They call their traditional territory Ainu Mosir, which means a peaceful land where the Ainu dwell, while the word Ainu itself simply means human. Their language, now unfortunately moribund, is an isolate tongue with no known ties to any of the major language families. As a result of their seemingly primitive culture and non-East Asian appearance, the Japanese often dismissed them as hairy barbarians, perceiving them as little more than savages. For most of history, the Ainu remained outside the authority of the empire. It was only in the last three centuries that the Tokugawa and Meiji regimes subjugated them, albeit not without many years of fierce resistance from the natives. The origins of the Ainu are shrouded in history, but their legends claim that they have been in northern Japan for a hundred thousand years before the Children of the Sun came. The full story is a little more complex. The first humans arrived on the Japanese archipelago around 40,000 years ago via great glacial land bridges during the last ice age. These were the forebears of Japan's first peoples, the Jomon, who lived primarily as hunter-gatherers using stone tools. By 5000 BC, they had developed a complex material culture, most famous for its iconic pottery. Around 1000 BC, new migrants began arriving in southern Japan from the Korean Peninsula and the Yangtze River Delta. These were the Yayoi, who were the principal ancestors of the modern Japanese people, and they introduced many innovations, including agriculture based on wet rice cultivation, as well as bronze and iron tools. Over the next centuries, Yayoi tribes gradually displaced or assimilated the Jomon, establishing various petty rice kingdoms from southern Kyushu to central Honshu, each ruled by a different clan. By 300 AD, the Yamato clan had emerged as the most powerful, uniting them under their banner and forming the earliest rendition of the Japanese Empire. Meanwhile, in the north, successors of the Jomon, known as Epijomon, continued to thrive. Around the 5th century AD, a Siberian tribe known as the Oktoksk diffused into these late Jomon territories via Sakhalin Island. These two cultures would be the primary building blocks of the emerging Ainu, which emerged as a recognizably unique culture as a result of the merging of the Epijomon and the Northern Sea Folk. The Ainu were a people divided on tribal lines and thus had regional differences among them, 
making it difficult to account for cultural shifts over their centuries-long existence. Much like their Jomon ancestors, the Ainu lived a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. During the spring, they chased brown bears coming out of hibernation, while seeker deer, rabbit, raccoon dogs and foxes were stalked year-round. Ainu innovations made them excellent hunters. They coated their arrows and spears with aconite poison, created sound decoys called epakini, which mimicked the cry of a buck, and set up ingenious bow traps rigged to self-fire when an animal triggered a tripwire. Perhaps the most crucial and spiritual aspect of Ainu subsistence was the salmon hunt, which occurred in autumn. Caught in abundance, salmon was then dried to last the year round. Ainu clothing was made from wild sources provided by the forest and rivers. The typical Ainu garb was a long robe called the atus, woven from bark fiber of a rare type of elm tree. Creating an atus took skill, as the process of rendering tree bark into a fabric took months. Shoes made of deer hide and dried salmon skin were also common, and men were often seen wearing a headdress woven from grapevines. Ceremonial clothing for festivals and weddings featured technicolored geometric designs which fulfilled the ritual function of protecting its wearer from hostile spirits. Personal grooming and bodily modifications played an important role. Mouth tattoos were common among women as a coming-of-age rite, and were applied by cutting the area around the lips with a knife, then injecting cooking ash under the skin. Men had long beards, which they never shaved past a certain age. The Ainu dwelled primarily in small villages on the banks of rivers, and had no equivalent to the great cities of Japan. Their humble homes were well adapted for the rugged northern landscape, and were made of a framework of wooden pillars and crossbeams, with the walls and roof filled in by dense bundles of thatch made of cogon grass. In the interior, a sunken hearth was dug, where a fire was lit to keep the well-insulated building warm. An Ainu home was a highly ritualized space, with a designated spot for every family member or guest around the fire pit. The Ainu were animists, who saw nature to be inhabited by innumerable divine beings, known as Kamui, which could be in anything – the trees, the rivers, the animals, even in human tools. The Ainu home was enshrined with various live-in gods. For example, the fire pit was the home of Ape Kamui, the spirit of fire, and had to be kept clean. Even the toilet had a spirit, named Roku Kamui, a noble being who would always be the first to help the household in times of danger. The most important spirit was Kimun Kamui, the god of mountains and bears. The Ainu honored him with a ritual called Iumante, where a bear cub was captured from the wild, then pampered as an honored guest for two years, with some legends even claiming it was fed with the breast milk of Ainu mothers. When the two years had elapsed, the bear would be ritually slaughtered by arrows, allowing its spirit to return to the heavens, where it would tell the great bear spirit of the honor shown to it by human folk. The Ainu lived in a symbiotic relationship with their gods. In their eyes, the humans took care of the spirits by living in harmony with nature, and the spirits in turn protected humans. When the Kamui failed to prevent accidents, they were often scolded. The history of the Ainu people is a saga defined primarily by their relationship with the Japanese. Our story begins in the 8th century in northern Honshu, where the Amishi tribes dwelled. With their appearance, they were probably related to the Ainu, and like them, were a collection of indigenous tribes that lived outside of the authority of the Yamato Emperor. The emperors of the Nara and early Heian periods had long plotted to conquer them, and from 709 onwards, the Japanese began building forts in Emishi territory. In response, the proudly independent Emishi began raiding Yamato lands, and this escalated into all-out war in 773. Over the next 30 years, the Japanese dispatched at least 10 armies into northern Honshu, but none were able to subjugate their long-bearded foes. The Emishi were master horse archers, 
able to easily dance circles around the Yamato forces, which were predominantly made up of heavy infantry. However, despite many early successes, the Emishi were still disunited tribes fighting against a centralized empire. This was a weakness the Japanese exploited in 794, when they convinced the powerful Shiwa clan to defect over to their side, fracturing the Emishi resistance and allowing the Yamato to subjugate them piecemeal by 811. Over the next few centuries, many Emishi fled north to Hokkaido, where they contributed to the formation of the nascent Ainu culture. Others assimilated into the Yamato Empire, albeit not without leaving a heavy mark on Japanese society. The adoption of Emishi war tactics by the early Heian military is considered the beginning of the development of samurai warfare, and the first proto-samurai were probably Emishi horse archers in the Yamato Emperor's employ. This has led to the common adage that the Japanese spirit was built on the ghost of the Emishi. Having conquered all of Honshu, the Japanese initially showed little interest in expanding into Hokkaido. Who would bother with invading some foggy islands on the edge of the world inhabited by hairy savages? They called these lands Ezo, meaning barbarian islands, and for the time being left them be. The Kamakura Shogunate, the first government to be controlled primarily by the samurai caste, was also the first Japanese regime to show significant interest in the island, using it as a penal colony for political exiles. The Kamakura also appointed the samurai clan Ando, who themselves probably had Ainu and Imishi ancestry, to open trade with various tribes. Left mainly to their own devices by the Japanese, the Ainu decided to do a little expansionism of their own on the Isle of Sakhalin. Their ancestors had occupied the southern half of the isle since the 11th century, but from the early 1200s onwards, they began pushing into its northern half, which was the native territory of the Nivk people, who were forced to submit themselves to the Yuan dynasty in 1263. Consequently, around the same time that the samurai of Japan clashed with the great invasion fleet of Kublai Khan on the shores of Tsushima and Kyushu, the Ainu went to war with the same empire in the forests of Siberia. For over four decades, the Mongols, alongside their Chinese, Jurchen and Nivk allies, struggled to pacify the sons of the Jomon. Despite being heavily outnumbered, the Ainu put up a stubborn fight but eventually they realized their struggle was futile and surrendered. Thus in 1308, the Ainu of Sakhalin became tributaries of the Great Khan. With Sakhalin under Yuan rule, the Ainu of Hokkaido could no longer migrate northwards as they had done for centuries, and this pushed their economic interests in the opposite direction, causing many tribes to increase trade with the Yamato to their south. Over the centuries, the Ainu slowly became more and more dependent on the metalware, weapons, lacquer balls and rice they imported from Japanese merchants. Conversely, northern samurai clans like the Ando grew rich from the hawk feathers, bear livers and dried fish they imported from the Ainu. This compelled them to set up a string of fortified trading posts on Hokkaido's southernmost tail, marking the first time that Ainu Mosir was directly colonized by Yamato people. As dependent as they were on Japanese goods, having outsiders park themselves on their front lawn made the Ainu antsy. Between 1456 and 1536, armed conflict would flare up between samurai clans and native tribes at least nine times. While the Ainu were not able to expel the Japanese out of southern Hokkaido, they were at least able to avoid being exploited by them, as their valiant resistance to Yamato dominance forced the samurai to trade with them on equal terms. This, however, was not to last. At the turn of the 17th century, Japan had emerged out of nearly 150 years of brutal civil war. By 1600, the firebrand daimyo Tokugawa Ieyasu had finished bringing the last of the empire's feuding samurai lords to heel, thereby establishing a shogunate that would rule over a unified Japan for the next 250 years. In 1606, 
the Tokugawa Bakufu ordered the construction of a castle on the southern tip of Hokkaido, bequeathing it upon the Matsume samurai clan, who were tasked with the defense of Japan's northern frontier against the unruly barbarians that dwelled beyond. To that end, the Matsume were granted exclusive rights over Ezo trade in 1644. This development had bad tidings for the Ainu. Much of their trade leverage over the Japanese had come from their ability to freely pick and choose which local daimyos they wished to do business with, a privilege they were now stripped of. What had once been a relationship of mutual exchange was reduced into a crooked trade monopoly as the Matsume set up forts along Hokkaido's eastern coast, where they regularly gouged the natives. The Ainu, being so dependent on Japanese rice and ironware, had no choice but to accept the exorbitant rates forced on them. To compound matters, the increasing amounts of fish and animals the Ainu hunted to sell into Japanese hands put a strain on the natural environment, disrupting the traditional Ainu lifestyle. One chieftain forlornly remarked that his tribe could not catch even one bear cub for their annual Iamante festival. Things got worse in the 1630s, when gold was discovered in inland Hokkaido, enticing many Japanese miners to push deeper into Ainu territory than any outsider ever had. Over time, increasing land and resource scarcity brought Ainu chieftains into conflict with one another. As fate would have it, one of these tribal wars would escalate into the last great hurrah of Ainu independence against the Yamato tide. By 1660, the two greatest Ainu chieftains of Hokkaido were Onobishi, who ruled the Hai tribe, and Shakushain, an 80-year-old leader of the Shibuchari tribe. Their two clans came to blows in 1666, when the Shibuchari refused to provide a bear cub for the Hei's Iomanti ritual, and a Hei hunter poached a valuable crane on Shibuchari land. As an internecine blood feud ensued, the elderly Shakushane led his warriors in a successful raid into Hei lands, chasing his Ainu foes into a Matsumi mining camp, which he put to the torch, killing the rival chieftain Onibishi in the process. This was a crossroads for Shakushane. The octogenarian probably never intended to start an outright rebellion against the Japanese, but he knew that by destroying a Japanese mining camp, he had certainly invited a violent reprisal from the Matsume lords to his south. Thus, the great Ainu chieftain doubled down and launched a war upon the Yamato to rid their exploitative influence from Ainu Masia for good. By June of 1669, Shakushane had rallied some 19 tribes to his banner, comprising over 3,000 warriors. With his confederation of freedom fighters, he carved a bloody path of destruction across his native land, destroying Japanese trading forts, mining camps and merchant ships, massacring those within. The Matsume were a small clan, and were only able to muster 80 samurai to fight this uprising, but luck was on their side. As Shakushane stabbed south for Castle Matsume, his advance was thwarted by torrential rain and floodwaters, allowing the small Japanese platoon to force his retreat through a withering hail of musket fire. Despite this, the Matsume knew they were still direly outnumbered, and thus begrudgingly they called for help from their rival samurai clans. Some 700 armed soldiers arrived from northern Honshu in the following months, striking north into Shekishane's lands. The Ainu put up dogged resistance, but despite outnumbering their foe, their poison-tipped arrows were unable to penetrate samurai armor, nor were their spears a match for samurai matchlock rifles. At the end of 1669, Shakushane saw the writing on the wall and surrendered. Ainu and Matsume leaders exchanged gifts, and a ritual drinking party was held to celebrate the new peace, during which Shakushane and his top warriors imbibed themselves in a fountain of sake. Yet samurai hospitality proved to be a mask hiding treachery. Perhaps fearing that Shakushane would once more rise up against them, they had the drunk chieftain and his closest followers massacred. This reignited the war, but by 1672, the heavily outgunned Ainu were once again brought to submission. 
After Shakushin's doomed revolt, the Matsume clan re-established their trade hegemony over all Ezo, building 60 more fortified outposts in the region. Most Ainu villages retained autonomy on paper, but the aborigines of Hokkaido were now fully dependent on the empire of the rising sun, and over the next two centuries, their land, way of life, and their culture would all slip out of their hands. Amidst increasing fears that the Russian Empire would seek to expand their influence into Hokkaido, the Tokugawa shogunate took direct control over the island in 1806 and implemented a policy of forceful assimilation aimed to fully integrate it into the Japanese nation. Ainu men were forced to become indentured servants and only clothed and fed properly if they gave up their native language and culture and became Japanese while Ainu women were forcibly married to Japanese men. As a result of these oppressive policies, the Ainu population on Hokkaido plummeted from 80,000 in 1806 to 15,000 just 60 years later. 1868 marked the Meiji Restoration Movement, where the Japanese overthrew the rule of the samurai and began to rapidly modernize their country. In the vein of creating a unified national identity, Ainu assimilation policies only intensified. The late 19th century saw the Meiji government encourage mass Japanese migration to Hokkaido, turning the Ainu into a minority in their own homeland. The Ainu were forced to learn Japanese and adopt Japanese names. Traditional customs like women's facial tattoos and the extremely important Iamante Bear Festival were outlawed. The traditional Ainu way of life was eradicated, with salmon fishing, tree felling, traditional house building and dugout canoe making all becoming illegal. Throughout much of the 20th century, the Ainu became almost entirely assimilated into mainstream Japanese society, with the word Ainu itself becoming a byword for perversity and backwardness. Still, the Ainu have survived into the modern age, a tiny community of less than 1,000 can be found in their ancestral territories of Sakhalin and the Kuril Islands, where they struggle for recognition from the Russian government to this day. The rest live mainly in Hokkaido, where a population of 25,000 maintains its identity amidst a sea of 5 million ethnic Japanese. Nevertheless, there is hope on the horizon. In June of 2008, the Japanese government officially recognized the Ainu as a distinct indigenous people of Hokkaido and affirmed their right to their traditional lifestyle. The modern Ainu have a long road ahead of them, but the will to revive their culture from the ashes is strong. No doubt in time, the ancient aborigines of Japan's past will contribute to the multicultural spirit of the nation's future. More videos on the history of Japan are on the way, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see the next video in the series. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description. To know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.